Hello everyone, this is Sakura Diesel, and welcome to the first episode of Film of the Year, a series where we talk about the history of movies, the beginnings, and the changes the industry has gone through during the years, and the important events and films that have shaped the industry that we know it today. If you did not see the last video where I've talked about how this series will work, you can watch that video in the description. But to give a nutshell version, the way this series will work is that for each decade, I'll be looking for movie slash events that have good enough information for me to cover. If there's enough research on a certain topic, and if it played a major role in shaping the industry, then it will be covered. As well as any minor events that have also played a role will be mentioned too, as the series goes on. Again, if there's enough info about them. And we'll also add some trivia at the end of each decade, just to make sure everything gets a fair mention. Also, some of the movies may not get a full review, but if there's something for me to say about a film, I will go ahead and offer a short opinion of the movie anyway. With that out of the way, before we even talk about the very first movie, we first need to talk about how the idea of motion pictures started, because every idea has to have come from somewhere, and movies are no exception. So to figure out how the concept of a moving picture started, we'll need to look at a few things. First, we'll look at the idea and theory of motion, how a human eye can make an ordinary object seem like it's changing slash moving. Then, we'll talk about the earliest forms of entertainment for a wide audience. And of course, you can't talk about movies without first talking about how cameras and taking pictures were used at the time. Once we start talking about all three of these ideas, we'll start to see how they each played a major role in forming the very first motion picture. Let's get started. The idea of motion, or at least the type of motion we're talking about for films, goes all the way back to ancient Greece. Greek philosopher and polymath Aristotle noted that after staring at a sun for long that he can still see the image of the sun in his vision after looking away. Roman poet Lucretius also mentioned something similar when he started remembering and seeing images after a dream he had. What these two had described is something known to us as persistent of vision. Persistence of vision is an optical illusion effect that happens when images are being displayed right before your eyes, and you can still see those images after they are gone. There are many types of optical illusions that go with persistence of vision. The one we're focusing on is motion. With persistence of vision, you can make still images move before your eyes using simple tricks like flipping pages, or spinning them around fast enough to where the pictures start coming to life. Many philosophers and scientists would continue to study motion for centuries, with people like Claudius Ptolemy, Greek mathematician and astronomer, noted his findings when rotating a pot or wheel with different colors on it, seeing the sectors of the colors forming into one color, and how the dots appear as circles when the wheel is spinning very fast. However, other scientists question some of Ptolemy's findings. One, an Arab physicist named Abahan al noted that the top part appears to be motionless when spun extremely quickly. The strange observation would take some time for other scientists to figure out, but while they were still discovering persistence of vision, other people like a pen would study another phenomenon that has been on people's minds for a while, a phenomenon that would also play a major role in not just movies, but in creating an image altogether. Around the early 11th century, Epidin was experimenting and analyzing a phenomenon known as Camera Obscura. A Camera Obscura is a darkened room with a small hole or lens projecting an image from one side into a solid wall or table from the opposite hole. Epidin would do extensive studies in trying to understand the relationship between the focus point and the pinhole. He would do some experiments by using three adjacent candles and seeing the effects on the wall after placing a cutout between the candles and wall. He noted how the rays of light from the candles would travel in a straight line through the small pinholes and concluded that they made a conic shape from one side of the hole and then another conic shape in reverse to the first one from the hole to the opposite wall in the dark room. This finding would inspire many other well-known scientists to perform their own experiments and continue where Ibidin left off. Thanks to the discovery, the phenomenon would help create the early form of an image projector known as the Magic Lantern. The Magic Lantern was developed around the 17th century, and these were the earliest forms of entertainment before movies. The Magic Lantern consisted of one or more lenses, a slot in which pictures inside transparent plates would be inserted, and a light source to project the image for an audience. The Magic Lanterns would use concave mirror to direct the light through the transparent plates, usually made of glass, and into the lens in front of a solid object, usually a wall. 
The glass slides would usually contain one to four pictures on each slide. The pictures would be either prints, photographs, or hand-painted. If the pictures were done by paint, then sometimes the painting would be done on oil paper, and black paint would usually serve as the background so that the pictures could be projected without distracting borders or frames, and the light source outside of sunlight would come from either an oil lamp or candles, seen as they were the only source of lighting at the time the device was made. A Dutch scientist by the name of Christian Higgins is said to have been one of the possible inventors for the magic lantern. His father, Cole Soltain, is said to have written about the camera obscure device he got from another Dutch inventor, Cornelius Durable. Using this and reading a 1645 edition of Athanasius Kitcher's written work on the magic lantern, Higgins set to work on inventing the magic lantern. When he made it, we're not entirely sure but it's possible that he might have made it around the same time he made a document containing 10 sketches of a skeleton taken off his skull. He wrote a little note that says, for representation by means of convict glasses with the lamp. So it's possible he might have made the device around 1659 when the document was made. However, it seems that Higgins wasn't too proud of his invention. In a 1662 letter to his brother Ludwig, he thought the device was too frivolous and was sure that it would bring harm to the family's reputation if the people were to find out who made the lantern. He even went as far as to ask his brother to sabotage the lantern after finding out that his father intended to show the lantern off to King Louis XIV of France. However, even if the king didn't get a chance to see it, that doesn't mean other people close to Higgins never saw the lantern. A possible candidate that might have had a chance to see Higgins' lantern was a godland mathematician by the name of Thomas Regiment Walt Jensen. It's possible that Walt Jensen might have learned about the magic lantern through the documents and decided to make one of his own. Between 1664 and 1670, he demonstrated his magic lantern throughout Europe, including places like Paris, London, Rome, and Copenhagen. The demonstrations helped slowly grow the popularity of the magic lanterns, and soon, by 1671, other people wanted to either purchase one or make one of their own, improving some features that would make the magic lantern stronger, such as better lighting, colorful, and detailed drawings. Throughout the early years towards the 18th century, people would add a couple of tricks and other parts inside the magic lantern, creating the early form and stages of horror entertainment. This was known as Phantom Mascore. During the late 18th century, people started to get obsessed with the supernatural, and the magic lantern was the perfect device to show pictures of demons and other supernatural creatures. People like magician physicist Paul Philidor would come up with several special effects to wow and scare the audience by using the magic lantern for his magic performance. Considered to be the first true Fandemagore show first shown in 1790, became his most successful show in Vieta from 1790 to 1792. One of the possible people that attended Paul's show was also famous magician Eddie Gaspard Robert. Studying his shows, Robert quickly understood how Paul was able to create his ghost with the magic lantern. After studying more on the magic lantern by reading works of Kischer, Robert would be inspired to create his own magic lantern, but instead of copying device from others, he would experiment and create a whole new and improved version of the magic lantern. The biggest improvements he made for the lantern was the adjustable lens and a movable carriage. No longer would you have to hold the magic lantern by hand. Now you could just have someone stand next to the lantern and move the device further or closer to the projector. Robert also made it possible to project several different images at the same time by using more than one painted glass slider. With this, the operator had the ability to manipulate images projected from an unseen location, creating a very ghostly effect for Robert's shows. With more improvements added to his magic lantern, Robert patented his device, naming it the Phantoscope. His Phantoscope was first demonstrated at the Pavillon de Electricure in Paris on January 23, 1798. The way Robert would prepare for his shows is very simple. Before each show, Robert would script out scenes that involve actors alongside his projections to create a convincing appearance of a ghost right before the audience. He would also use a couple of smoke and mirrors to help disguise the mechanisms behind his shows. Robert was also a very skillful painter. His skills would help him create accurate depictions of famous French heroes, such as Jean Paul Merritt, Voltaire, and Jean Chiquin's Rousseau. Then, during the shows, Robert would cut off all the lights to cast the audience in total darkness for several minutes at a time. He would also lock the doors so that no one leaves during the shows. Not only would he add smoke and mirrors, but he would also add sound effects into his shows, 
and he would move most of his glass slides very quickly to give an illusion that they're moving on screen. His show slash performance felt so real that audience often forgot that these were just tricks. Many believed that Robert had the power to bring people back from the dead. Even the police were called to place temporary hold on Robert's performance, believing that he had the power to bring King Louis XVI back to life. Well, regardless of the reason, it didn't stop Robert from showing his phantoscope to other parts of France until he was allowed back into Paris. Once he was able to perform again, he traveled to other places around the world, such as Russia, Spain, and the United States, among others, and his performance will help create new Phantom Moscone and Magic Lantern shows as a whole for decades and even a few more centuries. By the time the Magic Lantern began to reach its popularity during the early 1800s, new inventions started to rise rapidly as people started to have a clear understanding of motion and would make toys based on new theories that were starting to come to light. Remember the question people had about why certain things appeared to be motionless when spun very quickly? Well, on December 9th, 1824, a British psychian named Peter Mark Roger presented an explanation to the Royal Society using a wheel, noting that however rapidly the wheel revolves, each individual spork appears to be at rest. He claimed that the illusion is due to the fact that an impression made by the human eye will remain for a certain time after the motion has ceased. With this finding, people have started making toys using this illusion. These toys are known for being a predecessor to animation, as the gimmick to these toys was to make it seem like a set of drawings were actually moving. One of the first optical illusion toys was the Thaumatra, first released sometime in 1824 by British psychian John Arton Paris. The trick to this toy is that it contains one picture on each side, and the disc containing the pictures is attached to two strings. When you twirl the strings fast enough, the two pictures will look like they're combining into one picture. A few years after the release of the Thaumatra, a university student, Belgian physicist Joseph Pleidou, read Peter Rogers' Persistent of Vision article and did some experiments himself, investigating the phenomenon further. On June 9, 1829, Plato wrote a doctoral thesis for the University of Liège. In the doctoral, he drew a picture of a nameless disc he created to further experiment the persistence of vision. The disc, at the time known as the anorthoscope, was a device that can turn an anamorphic picture into a normal picture when spun fast. In another letter to correspondence Mathematique et Physique, published on December 5th of that same year, Plato included pictures of his disc and the resulting image. While he continued to revisit his concept, an English scientist, Michael Faraday, also read on Roger's work and did some experiments with his associates, finding new theories that help inspire Plato's research. Faraday not only knew about Plato's experiments, but he also personally corresponded with him, sending him his findings in a letter. The experiment that captured Plato's interest was the one with a fixed image produced by a turning wheel in front of a mirror. That research would inspire Plato to invent a new illusion toy. Around July of 1832, Plato sent Faraday a letter and a prototype disc that can produce a completely immobile image when rotated in front of a mirror. After many difficulties and attempts, he was finally able to construct a working model around November or December of 1832. The device would soon be known as the Venegasis Scope. The Venegasis Scope is an optical illusion device that contains a spinning disc attached to a handle. The disc contains a series of pictures along with a small rectangular slits placed evenly around the rim of the disc. When you spin the disc in front of a mirror and look through the slits, the images will give off the sense that they're moving. The certain amount of images and slots also give the Venegas' scope an interesting effect. If the images and the slots have the same number, the images will be animated in a fixed position, but will not drift across the disc. If there are fewer images than slots, the images will move in the opposite direction of where the disc is spinning. And if there are more images than slots, then the images will move in the same direction with the disc. The two published his disc on January 20th, 1833, in a letter to the correspondence Mathematique et Physique. Interestingly, an Austrian professor by the name of Simon Stanfer also invented his own Physikian scope, dubbed the Vescronus Garden, around February of that same year, almost a few weeks or even a month after Plato's publication, and was later granted a patent on May 7th, 1833. While the toy was successful for a while, a lot of people, including Plateau and Stanford, knew it could be made better. One of the drawbacks to the Fasikian scope was that only one person can view the animated drawings at a time. So after Plateau finally published his Anorphous scope device around January of 1836, 
he went and created another device where he combined his Vesekian scope and a Northus scope, resulting in a black lit transparent disc with sequent images that are animated when rotated on a counter rotating black disc, where more than one person can view the images. Sadly, the invention was never commercialized, and only two handmade discs were ever known to be made. Stanford had considered multiple ways in placing his images onto a device before settling on the same method Plateau was using. One of the methods he thought of was to place an image on a cylinder-like object, or on a long loop strip of paper stripped around two parallel rollers. While the latter would soon be used decades later, his former idea was also thought of by British mathematician William Honer after looking at Plateau's Vesekian scope. But it wasn't until about three decades later, a Rhode Island Brown University, William Esteen Lincoln, invented a cylinder animated toy in 1865. The animated toy, named the Zootrope, contains sequent images around a cylinder-like drum that has a viewing slit above the images. This would allow easy uses of replacing the strips with a new set, and now more than one person can view the pictures when looking through the slits. The Zootrope, at least in America, would be patented on July 27, 1866, and would be developed and distributed by Milton Bradley. Yes, that Milton Bradley. Anyway, with the much more popular success of the Zootrope, the popularity of the Vesekian scope would soon fade away, while other Zootrope-like devices would soon be made years later. Anyway, now that we have a clear history and understanding on the theory of motion, there's one more brief history we need to cover. We need to talk about a very important device that made capturing pictures and motion possible. We're going to talk about the camera and photography. Going back to the camera obscure for a bit, after the immense discovery of the camera obscura, people have been trying to create a camera that can take and capture fixed images for hundreds of years. It's been proven from German scientist Johann Scholl to Swedish chemist Carl Scholle that when silver salt is exposed to some kind of light, the salt will have a darkening effect and would change properties, making it possible to create an image with this detail in mind. However, when other people tried this experiment out, people like early English photographer Thomas Wedgwood and the inventor of the first camera, Frenchman, Joseph Nieve Fort Nieps, found that even with silver salt, the results would turn out negative and the image would never stay permanent. Nieps continued to experiment, turning to other chemical substances that are also affected by light. The substance that he ended up choosing was bitumen of Judea, a semi-solid form of oil with a tar-like appearance. Nieps was pleased to see that the bitumen coating became less soluble after being exposed to light. Dissolving the bitumen in lavender oil and mixing the substance with pewter, Nieps found the perfect material to employ, calling his project heliography, literally meaning sun drawing. With this, Nieps successfully created the first permanent photograph from his early camera obscura somewhere around 1826 or 1827 on a sheet of bitumen coated pewter. While Nieps and his associates were pleased with the results, his heliography process did present a huge drawback. The exposure time with the pewter coated bitumen was a very long process. It would take somewhere between 8 hours to even days before a picture was captured. To try and solve these issues, Nieps teamed up with a good friend and colleague of his, Louis Daguerre. Sadly, the partnership would not last for long, for Nieps Ports Nieps would later die of a stroke on July 5, 1833. He was only 68 at the time. But with what process he was able to do, Daguerre would continue where he left off and finish the work. While Daguerre worked in improving the camera obscura design, before his death, Nieps experimented with other chemicals in trying to improve the heliography process. Daguerre continued with Nieps' research, and while experimenting, he turned back to Nieps' earlier experiment using silver salt. After many trials around 1837, Daguerre was able to develop a high contrast and extremely sharp image using a thin silver-plated copper sheet coating the surface with silver ironine. The gear would then expose the camera. The exposure would still take some time, anywhere to a few minutes to a few hours. After the exposure, the gear would treat the plate with mercury vapor at 167 degrees Fahrenheit, 75 degrees Celsius, and heated the salt water in a dark room. With this, the gear would remove any silver ironine that did not change from the light exposure and would leave behind a fixed camera image. The gear dubbed this process the daguerreotype. While Daguerre had some trouble in trying to commercialize this process, word of the daguerreotype eventually made its way to the French government, who agreed to purchase the rights of the process and make it public knowledge in exchange for a life pension of Daguerre and Nieppe's son, Isidore. 
With the daguerreotype process becoming public knowledge around early January 1839, the first commercial photographic camera built by Alphonse Giroux used the daguerre exposure process. The camera cost about 400 French francs, and it quickly caught the interest of many people, mostly the wealthy, but with more improvements of the process, soon middle class and even poor people can have their pictures taken for the first time. The daguerreotype camera also found its way outside of France, in places like Britain, where British scientist and early photographer Henry Fox Talbot felt the pressure to disclose his photography process to the Royal Institution on January 25, 1839, known as the calotype. The calotype is a phonogenic drawing process in which a writing paper is soaked in table salt, then brushed lightly with gallic acid and silver nitrate. With this, it helps bring out an invisible slight lanted image on the exposed paper. This type of process would be used to make film strips later down the road, and Talibis process was the first to utilize negative printing, whereas the Gare's process only produced a sharp and direct positive print. However, it is possible to make as many positive prints with the negatives from the calotype by doing a simple contact printing. Contact printing is where you would place a film negative emulsion side down on top of a light sensitive paper in a dark room and expose the paper to a light source to develop the final print. Talibet patented his process around 1841, and while his camera saw some success in both Britain and France, it didn't reach the same popularity or widespread as the daguerreotype cameras. At the time, people found the process slower compared to the process time of the daguerreotype camera. The images were sometimes either blurred or they fade away over time, where the daguerreotype cameras could produce a fixed and clear positive image. But as time went on and people began to understand the calotype, the process would soon be used in modern photography, with the help of new photographic inventions. For the time being, during the 1840s to the 1860s, the daguerreotype camera and process was the most common and popular process for a while and the camera would reach its highest popularity once it came to the United States on September 20th, 1839, right around the time when the nation was expanding westward during their manifest destiny. But with all great inventions, the daguerreotype camera would soon be outdated and find itself competing with new and better process as the years went on. From American inventor Alexander Wolcock and his partner John Johnson creating a concave mirror to improve the Gare's lenses, earning them the first U.S. patent camera on May 8, 1840, to English photographer Frederick Scott Archer's new Colonial process, created in 1848 and published in 1851, which helped make the calotype negatives give a sharper image, replacing both the calotype and the daguerreotype process around the 1860s. As photography started to become a new form of capturing and creating art, the medium would soon give rise to famous photographers. One of the most famous and important photographers would be English photographer by the name of Edward Minebridge. Born on April 8, 1830 in England, Minebridge moved to the United States at the age of 20 with the goal of making a name for himself. He first moved to New York in 1850 setting up as a bookseller before moving further west to the recently new state California in San Francisco in 1855 where his bookselling became successful. In July of 1860, Mybridge took a stagecoach back to New York as he planned on traveling back to England for business. But disaster struck when the stagecoach turned into a violent runaway, and Mybridge found himself ejected out of the coach, landing on the rock and suffering a major head injury after the coach had crashed into the Texas border. The driver and the other passenger were killed on the scene, while other passengers also suffered bad injuries. Luckily, Mybridge was able to recover from a hospital at Fort Smith, Arkansas, where he was under care for about three weeks before moving to New York for another six weeks and moving again to finish his recovery in England. But the accident did cause him to suffer from bad headaches, double vision, deafness, loss of taste and smell, and confusion. During the stay in England, his psyche and Sir William Gall suggested Mybridge to take up photography. While it's unclear when Mybridge started his life as a photographer, or if he ever learned photography before being injured, it is known that he was at least familiar with photographs during his time in America, and he even sold landscape photographs captured by Carlton Watkins. It is possible that Mybridge took up photography during his stay in America, and even more possible that he continued his photography skills during his recovery. When Mybridge returned to the United States in San Francisco on February 13, 1867, he changed his career from a bookseller to a photographer. He converted a lightweight two-wheel, one-horse carriage into a portable darkroom for his equipment, 
and named it Helios Flying Studio. Bybridge would mainly photograph landscapes around San Francisco or architectural subjects, but unlike other photographers at the time, he didn't just capture, but he would also heavily edit the photos to give them a more artistic appeal, inserting stuff like clouds or other artistic effects. Bybridge produced over 400 different stereographed cars containing his work, selling them to many distributors, and he became very successful. He started advertising for commissions, and many people started to request his skills, including the U.S. government on multiple occasions. The most famous request for him was to go and take pictures of the Tinglith Native American tribe over the newly acquired Alaska Territory in 1868. But the biggest and challenging project that would make Mybridge famous would be the famous Horse in Motion project. Now up until this point, there have been some examples of instantaneous and putting motions into photographs before, in the streets of London and Paris, but these will make people walk towards the camera at a speed in which a camera could capture them. When former governor of California, Leland Stanford, wanted a proper picture that captures a horse when running at full speed, he turned to Mind Bridge sometime in 1872 or 1873, asking him to help with the project. At the time, many artists thought that only one or two hoofs would always be on the ground when a horse is galloping or trotting. The human eye just couldn't fully see the motion of a horse, and Stanford wanted to prove once and for all how a horse moves, and knew that a camera capturing the real moment would help prove a point. Mybridge hesitated in this project, believing that photographic technology had not advanced far enough to capture a horse running at full speed. But as Stanford kept on assisting, Mybridge eventually decided to give it a try. Stanford allowed Mybridge to use his best trotter, Oxiden, for the project, while Mybridge and a few of his crew used white sheets as a bright backdrop and placed some on the ground. To make sure they captured the motion, Mybridge developed a spring-activated shutter, leaving a big enough opening to reduce the shutter speed. After capturing the image, Mybridge was not satisfied with the result. The camera did capture the hoofs of the horse while trotting, but the picture was very blurry, making it difficult to see the action. However, while Stanford agreed that the photo wasn't the best in terms of capturing a clear image, he was very enthusiastic when he carefully studied the legs in the picture. While the image was never published, knowing that Stanford was pleased with the outcome, Mybridge promised to come back and try this project again when better technology has come out. Four years later, in 1877, he did just that. After coming back to California from his travels to Central America and working on other projects, Mybridge was ready to have a second go at capturing Oxygen at full speed this time. With the help of engineers and technicians from Stanford Central Pacific Railroad, Mybridge was able to experiment and develop a faster shutter and an electrical trigger mechanism. With this, Mybridge was able to capture a new picture with Oxygen with a much clearer result. Though he still had a retouch artist recreate the still fuzzy picture, but with this, Mybridge published his picture as a cabinet card, and he sent his findings to several newspapers, and they were met with enthusiasm. But there were several critics that seemed skeptical that his picture contained the truth about a horse's movement, due to it being heavily manipulated. So Mybridge and Stanford began working on a new project that would convince everyone that there are no tricks or manipulation. Stanford helped finance this next project, it allowed Mybris to set up 12 cameras at his farm in Palo Alto. With the help of the San Francisco engineers, Mybris had the racetrack whiten, placing wires under the surface while using white planks as backgrounds. Mybris ordered some lenses from England, while the engineers built the shutter system so that when the horse ran over the wires, the shutters would activate, capturing the action much faster. To make sure there were witnesses to prove their claims, a couple of turf men and members of the press were invited to watch the experiment on June 15, 1878. Two Stanford's racehorses were used during the experiment. The first horse, named Abe Edgington, trotted a mile across the track with a sulky wheel as he tripped over all the wires. The results were tiny, but had a fine detail and also proved that a trotting horse assumes inconceivable positions than the graceful movements that people once associated with horses. After that, running mare Sally Garner was up next, and she raced across the track, and the results would be a groundbreaking one. The pictures show that when galloping, all four hooves would sometimes be lifted off the ground simultaneously. The photographs and projects were immediately hailed as a success, and would quickly garner worldwide acclaim once news reached. Mybers published his pictures as six different series of cabinet cards, titling them The Horse in Motion, 
and would start giving lectures about his work at universities and art schools between 1878 and 1879. At first, Mybridge used a magic lantern device called a stereoptic scope to exhibit his work, but to show the graceful movements of his photographs, he took up the technology Plato used for his physician scope and made his own projection device dubbed the Zoroprasket scope in 1879. The Zoroprasket scope would be seen as an early form of movie projector and one of the key steps for motion pictures. Bybridge would use this device in his lectures, and he would do more experiments with motion in not just animals, but humans as well, with better camera setups. His experiments would help influence other scientists and photographers in experimenting with motion pictures. One of these would be French scientist and later chronophotographer Etienne Chu Murray. When Murray heard and saw Mybridge's motion works, he invited the Englishman over to Paris to have Murray study and to have Mybridge demonstrate his works. Murray saw great potential in having a camera becoming a recording device, and he set out to make his own camera with the goal to take multiple pictures in just a matter of seconds with just one camera as opposed to the multiple cameras Mybridge used. In 1882, Mary made a gun-like camera dubbed the chronophotographic gun, using dry photographic plates made possible with the help of famous American inventor and photographer George Eastman. Mary took 12 consecutive frames per second, all recorded on the same camera. They were the size of a postage stamp and were arranged around the edge in a circular photographic plate. With more improvements, Mary would also use his camera to capture and record animal movement, and Mary would later coin his technique, the chronophotography, which would also be another step in helping to form motion pictures. And finally, one person would be the first to invent and experiment the new media. Enter French artist and inventor Louis Le Prince. Born in Mitz, France on August 28, 1841, at a young age, Prince always had a fascination for photographs and art, thanks to his father becoming friends with the late Louis Daguerre, the person responsible for inventing the daguerreotype process. While studying chemistry and physics, as well as working as a photographer and painter, Prince saw the increasing development with photographic technology and the slow rise of motion pictures. With another groundbreaking achievement from George Eastman inventing and patenting a light flexible paper film and a roll holder for the paper film, photography soon became a thing that anyone can do, not just professionals anymore. Eastman would make some significant improvements with the paper film, coating a layer with gelatin, and thus making and selling his first ever Konak camera in 1888, with a tagline that states, You push the button, we do the rest. It would soon become a big seller. With all the new inventions and development happening around Prince, he decided to join and try his luck in inventing a camera that can record moving images. With permission from his wife to borrow her workshop at the New York Institution for the Deaf, Louis Prince designed a 16 lens camera around 1886. The camera, as the name applies, would have 16 lenses, each controlled by electric magnetic shutter, where the rear of the camera would contain two sets of spools of Eastman's paper film side by side. The upper spool would be connected to a drive shaft that could be operated by hand or attached to a motor. Prince applied for an American patent on November 2, 1886. The camera would be manufactured in Paris around 1887, where Prince would return and study his invention with his friends and family members in Les France. While the camera was able to capture motion, photographing 16 pictures in a second, it did present a major flaw with the camera. When working, each roll of film was moved alternately, and each lens would photograph a scene from slightly different viewpoints. With this, if Prince was to show his work, the image would have jumped about. The only known surviving work using this camera is a sequence of 16 frames of a man walking a corner, filmed in Paris around 1887, and used a single glass plate rather than Eastman's film paper. By the time Prince's 16 lens camera was granted a patent on January 10, 1888, that same day Prince was developing another camera, a single lens camera this time that can capture moving pictures. Prince's assistants, Frederick Mason and James Lawnley, would help build the camera around the mid to late 1888, with Mason working on the body and wooden parts, and Lawnley would help with the design and the working mechanical parts. The camera would have two lenses, actually. The top lens would serve as a viewfinder, and the bottom would be the photograph lens. With the film strip being Eastman's paper film roll, the camera would also contain a lever for focusing. When used, the camera would capture a scene at about 5 to 7 frames per second. Prince would patent the device to London on the same day his patent for the 16-lens camera was granted on January 10, 1888. 
His single lens camera would be granted a patent on November the 16th, 1888. Only three films that Prince captured with his camera would survive. The first picture he made with his invention would be known as the Round Hay Garden film on October the 14th, 1888, where most of Prince's family members, including his son Adolfi and Prince's mother-in-law Sarah Whiteley, who actually passed away 10 years after being shot in her first and only film. The other two films that Prince had shot would be known as the Traffic Crossing Lead Bridge and Accordion Player, both recorded late October of the same year. With the movie's film, Lewis now needed a projector to show these movies. He turned to James Longley to create these projectors. While these projectors were never patented, two were made and tested. The first was a single lens projector where the frames would be printed on glass and mounted in a mahogany frame. The film would be moved at 7 frames per second in a continuous spiral. However, the heat of the lamp and the movement of the frames would often cause the glass to break. So James developed a 3 lens projector where the frames would be mounted individually in 3 flexible strips of Willingston paper with brass eyelids to move them. The projector would presumably alternate between the three strips slash lenses, and each strips would move when the light was cut off. I say presumably because the only ones that were able to see the projectors in action were those closest to Prince, with Longley claiming that the three lens projector was the most successful. But sadly, Lewis Prince would never get the chance to project his movies to the public. Some of you may be asking why, and thinking that if Prince was the first to make movies, how come he's not well known? Well, there were plans for Prince to return to New York with his wife and children, and his wife made preparations for her husband to demonstrate his latest invention to the world. On September the 16th, 1890, after visiting his brother in Dijon, Lewis was seen boarding a train back to Paris to meet with his friends. But sadly, when he got on the train, he was never seen again. Lewis's disappearance is a mystery that still remains unsolved to this day. Despite a long, determined, and exhaustive search to find him from police members from France and Scotland Yard, to family members and friends of Prince, nothing, not even so much as a hair, was ever found of Lewis. He was declared legally dead on September the 16th, 1897. If he was found, and if he was dead on that day, he would have been 56 years old. There are two possible theories to give some sort of reason for what happened to Lewis. One being suicide. In 1890, there was a report of a drowned man being pulled from the sun that bears some strong resemblance to Louis Le Prince. However, when the police took a closer look, they found that the body was too short to be Prince, and there's no record of Prince's mental state to suggest that he's suicidal. The other theory for his disappearance is sabotage. Since the disappearance, Lewis's family suspected that famous American inventor Thomas Edison might have hired a hitman to murder Prince so that he could take credit in being the first person to invent motion picture. But there was no strong evidence to ever suggest foul play. However, do keep this fact in mind as this would not be the last time that Prince's family would have some connection with Edison in the near future. While we'll most likely never know the true story of what happened to Louis Le Prince, there is a happy ending to this story. While at the time, Louis didn't get the recognition of being the father of moving pictures, later on, people would start to know about him and start giving him the proper respect and recognition he deserves. And in 1930, a plaque was held and placed at the site of his workshop in Leeds, where Prince's daughter attended and presented her father's two cameras to the Science Museum, where it's now currently displayed at the National Media Museum in Bradford, England. <sighs> okay, we've covered a lot of stuff in the very first episode, but a lot of these events, theories, and inventions are going to play a part for motion pictures as we continue and start talking about them. We've already taken a look at how many inventions, toys, and techniques are going to play a part when creating motion cameras, and even got a glimpse of what early films are going to look like moving forward. Believe me, there was a lot of other stuff I could have covered, but I think I've covered all the really important stuff that'll come in use. Hopefully you viewers have found this video to be informative and fun for what I had to present. I certainly had a nice time learning stuff I never knew and learning new stuff on topics I knew beforehand. If there was any information you think I might have either glossed over or skipped or even got some facts mixed up, don't be afraid to let me know down in the comments. I'll try to correct some in future videos whenever I have the time. So, now that we got the prehistory stuff out of the way, next time we'll finally start talking about movies and their early stages going into the 1890s. We'll talk about their impact and how once an industry many thought was a fad would soon become a new form of media for decades to come. 
This is Sakura the Diesel saying thank you for watching my brand new series. Hope you guys are loving the new format. Hope you're learning something as the series will go on. And I hope you're ready when we start reviewing movies again. If you have enjoyed this series, hit that like button. If you have any movies for me to talk about, whether it be for this new series or as just a plain review, let me know down in the comments. Also, don't forget to check out mine and Barney's co-op channel Review Bros, where we review movie and TV shows together. And if you're big into Let's Plays, check out my gaming channel. The links will be in the description below. But this has been Sakura Diesel saying thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all at the next episode of Film of the Year where we're going to start talking about movies from the 1890s. Till then, take care everybody.